With bloodshot eyes, a soldier gazed upon his comrade lying lifeless. His vision was consumed by a sea of crimson. A traumatized and shell-shocked man stood, a blade lodged in his left shoulder, bearing witness to the horrors of war. The soldier saw his comrade's lifeless form, a casualty of the battle that left only the absence of life in its wake. Contemplating the immense bloodshed, the man questioned the necessity behind such violence. Behind him, he discovered the lifeless body of his former master, Sa Hyung Jang Mun, triggering a flood of memories. The man remembers his master's and his comrade's deaths, calling out their names. We can see their deaths as Sa Hyung is pierced by something on his shoulder, Sai is sliced in half, and Saji suffers the same fate. All of his comrades attacked and tried to kill a powerful being, but ended up dying. The man vividly remembers it, biting his lips in frustration, thinking that they are all dead and he is all alone. Over twenty different sects, including the tenth great sects and the ultimate military unit composed of the elites of the elites, can be seen with hundreds of lifeless soldiers. Only one man survived the tragedy. Their clash with Chunman resulted in complete annihilation. Chunman is the being that everyone attacked. Out of frustration, the man keeps biting his lips, causing them to bleed because he blames the one who caused all the deaths. It is because of one man, Chunman. He lays atop a mountain of corpses as he looks down on the soldier. Chunman is the demon sent from the skies by the devilish group who turned the entire world into a bloodshed. The leader of the heavenly demon sect, whose name is Chunom, has red eyes, long hair, and a demon-like presence. We can see that he was stabbed multiple times as blades stuck on his body like it meant nothing to him. Chunom spoke to the soldier, talking about the Mount Hua sect, which he considers unfortunate, the disciple of the Mount Hua sect. The soldier looked at the demon with disdainful eyes as he tried to stand up. He stood up and noticed that his entire arm was amputated and he was coughing blood. The demon said that he's the only one who was able to get out of there alive, and he could have boasted about the glory of having killed him for his entire life. But it seems that this is as far as he and him will go. The soldier responded, shut up already. But the demon continued to speak, saying that he has every right to be proud of the soldier, even though he had help from many people, as his sword eventually reached his body. The demon reached out his hand to him and said that, in his name Chunom, he acknowledged his swordsmanship. The soldier pulled out the blade from his left shoulder while in pain. The demon recognized the Mount Hua sect swordsmanship as the greatest in the world. The soldier screams at demon and telling him to shut up while he rushed up to him wanting to have a revenge. The demon looked at the soldier with pity and said that it was quite a shame and told him that if he were given just one more day he would have been able to truly become a man befitting the name of Chunma. The soldier still continues to rush on him while his sword glows beautifully like Sakura Blossom to the demon. As the soldier engaged in battle, the demon says that this must also be his destiny. The demon looked down at the enraged soldier rushing towards him and tells him that he will remember the disciple of the Mount Hua sect. The demon added that this was not the end, as the demons would return. When that time comes, the world will be overrun by demons, and no one will be able to stop them. Fueled by rage, the soldier effort severed the demon's head, slicing his neck with such force that the swords that was on his body was cut into two. He cutted the demon's head like from the demon slayer in a quick flash. The demon's head flew through the air, eventually rolling down among the mountains of dead soldiers. With the demon slain, the hardship came to an end, and the war ended. The sun rose, its bright rays illuminated the soldier, reminding him of the approaching inevitability of death, and raising concerns about the fate of the Mount Hua sect. Deep in thought, the soldier looked behind and saw the mountains of corpses and the demon's body still standing, despite its decapitated head. All the members of the Mount Hua sect had lost their lives in this place. Alongside the sect members, the followers of the Mount Hua sect had also met their demise, leaving only the powerless children behind. Falling down flat, he questioned whether all the bloodshed caused by the Mount Hua sect was truly meaningful. Blaming himself, he wondered if only he had been a bit more dedicated to training. Perhaps he could have saved at least one more life. To him, everything felt utterly meaningless. The soldier lay among his fallen comrades, feeling exhausted and calling it the end of a plum blossom bloom. He panted, waiting for his last breath, and the last words he uttered were, Oh, the Mount Hua sect. Here, we learn the name of the soldier, Chung Myung. He was the thirteenth disciple of the esteemed Mount Hua sect and one of the three greatest swordsmen of the Plum Blossom Sword Saints. Having vanquished the demon, who had wrought destruction and chaos upon the world, he took his final breath atop the headquarters mountain of the heavenly demon sect. The short anecdote became his sole legacy, the only thing he left behind in this world. 
Chun saw his past and thinking ID he is having his life flashing before his eyes and seeing himself being as a baby and was adopted by the masters. He saw himself training every day. When he was a child, practicing their swordsmanship every day he remembers one teacher calling him angrily. Chun and his classmate, who had been beaten up, stood before their teacher. The teacher told Chun that he was an ascetic practitioner before becoming a martial artist, emphasizing that power without ethics can only be seen as violence. As his life flashed before his eyes, he vividly remembered the well-being and discipline instilled by his teacher. In his childhood, despite being a disciple of the Mount Hua sect, he grew tired of the teachings and couldn't fully comply with them. Despite receiving undue attention due to his talent, he knew deep down that he was merely a rookie within the Mount Hua sect. He questioned himself, pondering why he hadn't realized back then that everything he possessed was a result of the Mount Hua sect's influence. Suddenly, his master, Sahyung Jangmin, appeared before him, inquiring if he regretted his past. He replied with a resounding affirmation, expressing regret for not being more dedicated to following the teachings of the Mount Hua sect and for not striving to become stronger. He believed that, had he been more committed, he could have altered the tragic outcome of the events. His master reassured him, telling him that there was no need for regret, as the Mount Hua sect would endure. With a proud smile on his face, the master assured him that no matter what happened, the Mount Hua sect would always prevail. The story takes a turn when Chun becomes a kid again and gets hit on the head by another child in a small, poor house. Chun screams out Chunma and thinks that the kid was Chunma. The kid told him that Chunma is already dead and tells Chun that he was just having a nightmare while getting mad at him. The kid continues talking, saying that everyone has already gone to bed and asks Chun why he had the nerve to sleep so late. Chun is really confused about what's happening, waking up in an unknown place and being confronted by a kid. He still doesn't understand what's going on and asks him to put down the stick. The kid just laughs at him hilariously. Chun thinks that this doesn't make any sense anymore and thinks that he is Chung Myung, one of the Plump Blossom's sword saints. Little did he know Chun was reincarnated as a child. He is someone even the leader of the Beggar's Union treats with respect. You see, the Beggar's Union is one of the ten great sects. And yet the little brat is being cocky. The kid swings his sticks and tells Chun that he is dead to him today. Of course, our hero says that he will make sure to teach him a lesson and block that slow swing first. He reaches out his hand and is surprised that it's short. At this point, he didn't realize that he was reincarnated as a kid. The sticks are about to hit him, and he can't believe that his hand is short. He can't block that attack if it's that short. The kid smacks Chun with all his might, making him angry. The kid then repeatedly smacks him again and again, asking him if he doesn't understand and promising to make sure he completely understands. He tells Chun that there's a degree to which a person can lose their mind, and a good beating will smack it out of him. Another kid enters the house and sees Chun getting beaten. Nevertheless, the random kid leaves and says he'll come back later, as Chun shouts for him to spare him. After that encounter, he goes down to the river to wash off and heal his bruises. He has never been beaten this badly, even in the Mouth Hua sect. Then he realizes that even if it's for the sake of the brat, he will make sure to take care of the beggars in the beggar union. He remembers the kid and trembles with anger. While he is down by the river washing his feet and letting the water flow, he looks down underwater and becomes curious about the child he sees reflected in the water. He pinches his face everywhere and doesn't know what's going on. He asks himself if this is the reincarnation mentioned in Buddhism. The random kid from earlier comes to check on Chun and calls him out. Chun says that he saw the kid when he was getting beaten, the one who ran away instantly. The kid asks if he is alright and tells Chun that Wang Chu is always like that, but he went overboard today. Chun tells him one thing but then changes it to two things, asking him to ask him two questions, with a serious look on his face. He asks if he is a beggar. Suddenly, an awkward silence appears, and the kid says it's kind of obvious if you look at what he's wearing. Chun curls down with frustration and asks why he became a beggar in his reincarnation. He then gets up and wants to ask the second question while the kid silently listens. He asks about the demon Chuma, asking if the kid knows who he is. The kid cringes, and Chun thinks he is acting quite normal for someone who was badly beaten, but it looks like he was wrong. Chun shouts at him to answer his question. The kid sighs and says that he knows who Chunma was. He tells him that Chunma was the leader of the heavenly demon sect who died 100 years ago. Upon hearing the answer, our hero just stands there in shock. He is so shocked that he realizes it was 100 years ago. He grabs the kid and asks if it's been 100 years since Chunma died, screaming at him in panic. Chun keeps screaming and asking if he is telling the truth. The kid responds that lying to him wouldn't benefit him anyway. 
He then lets go of the kid and can't believe that it has been 100 years. He asks himself why couldn't they have let him reincarnate to the time right after he died. Our hero is dumbfounded and a bit depressed when he learns about it, feeling as if he's been left alone in this world. How could this thing go wrong? The kid asks if he's alright and shows concern for Chun, who is having panic attacks. Chun then remembers the Mount Hua sect and asks the kid if it still exists. The kid responds that he has no clue about it. Once again, Chun is dumbfounded and then asks the kid if he is a beggar, even though it's obvious. He asks the kid if he is a beggar because that means he's a part of the beggar's union. He explains that the Mount Hua sect is one of the ten great sects, just like the beggar's union. He asks the kid if he knows what he's talking about. The kid has no clue what he is talking about and says that it's nonsense. Chun explains what the ten great sects are and mentions a huge map. He talks about the Shaolin Temple, the Wooding Ashen Sect, Kong Tong Sect, King Cheng Sect, the Lotus Order, Southern Island Sect, Kunlun Sect, the Beggar's Union, and lastly, the Southern Edge Sect. But the kid doesn't understand what he's saying and says that there is no such thing as the Mount Hua Sect among the Ten Great Sects. This means that the Mount Hua Sect isn't part of the Ten Great Sects anymore. Chun thinks about how that is possible while panicking. Suddenly, he grabs the kid by his shirt and shakes him intensely, telling him that the country island bumpkins have become one of the ten great sects, specifically the southern island sect that the kid mentioned. He added by asking if the Mount Hua sect isn't part of the ten great sects anymore. The kid doesn't have any clue about Mount Hua, but now that he thinks about it, he remembers hearing about such a sect existing on the Shanxi province map. Our hero is shocked to hear this. He asks about the Shanxi province and wonders if it's on that map somewhere. The kid responds that he's not sure if they are part of the ten great sects, but as far as he knows, the Mount Hua sect has already fallen. Our hero just stares at him dumbfounded and can't believe that Mount Hua has fallen, even though it was one of the three most prominent sects in the world, along with the Wooding and the Northern Royal Family. Chun, let's go the kid again, causing him to fall to the ground while speechless from hearing this news. He then refuses to believe it and needs to see it with his own eyes. Chun looks really confident and is now planning to go to Mount Hua to see if it's true. The kid tells Chun, I wouldn't if I were you, and explains that if he doesn't want to get beat up again, he should just go begging instead. Chun shouts at the kid, calling him a bastard, and tells him that if he has more questions, he should just answer instead. The kid is a bit annoyed that Chun is being stubborn and not listening to him at all. He asks about his current body and asks for his name. The kid responds and asks on why would a beggar have a name that he can just call himself whatever he want he then tells him to call him Cho Sam. Chun thinks that name sounds like a beggar's name and speculates that his body is around 15 or 16 years old, judging from his skin. The kid asks why a beggar would know his age. Chun replies that it's fine if he doesn't know anything about his body, but instead he wants to know his name and the name of the brat who beat him. The kid responds, asking if he doesn't remember anything, and proceeds to tell his name, Ku Chil. The one who beat our hero is Ku Pal, but they call him Wang Cho. Chun nods respectfully. Cho Sam tells him to listen carefully, saying that he repaid his favor twofold and will return grudges tenfold. He then says to remember the name Chung Myung of the Mount Hua sect because the next time they meet, he will return today's favor. He walks out and says that he'll be leaving now, but then he comes back, confused about which way is Mount Hua in the Shaanxi province. Ku Chil just sighs. We call just call him Chil because he's a very chill guy. Afterwards, Chun can be seen running and saying that he's just going to run there by foot because in his past life, he didn't consider riding a horse as something slow. He falls down face flat and thinks he's going to die from tiredness. You see, his body isn't fit at all, and he's already tired after running for only a few minutes. He needs to get to the Shaanxi province but knows it's impossible with his current physical condition. He thinks about how to get to the Shaanxi province while burying his face in the ground. He smirks and has an idea. This is where the trickery of Great Chung Myung comes into play. He laughs and thinks of something. His plan is simple, he just needs to train himself in martial arts. He thinks that the others probably don't realize how amazing this opportunity is. He's really excited about it. He then thinks that even those who have reached the peak of their martial arts skills have regrets. They regret not focusing more on the fundamentals when they were younger. We can see Chun slacking off, sleeping on a tree branch. He says that they will also regret not pretending to train when their teacher asks them to and not getting caught drinking liquor. He just needs to repeat it and can do it all over again. The first thing he needs to do is find a place where he can avoid contact with the physical world the most. Chun spots a good spot for his training. He sits down, leans against the tree, and tries to meditate because he has countless theories of advanced martial arts techniques stored in his head. 
every martial arts technique in the history of the Mount Hua sect reside by his side, and he knows tons of methods of inner Kai cultivation techniques. He explained if he doesn't limit himself to just the technique of Mount Hua sect, the amount he'll learn will easily multiply, and out of the many techniques he will first learn is the equilibrium. Chun explains to us what kind of martial art technique it is. He explains that it's a technique that can be found very cheaply in illegal street stores. His reason for learning this seemingly cheap technique is because it's actually quite valuable. Chun relaxes himself and tries to focus on his breathing. It is one of the beginner techniques of the Mount Hua sect. Everyone who enters the sect starts by learning this technique. His fists glow blue, and he explains that while the technique may not significantly increase one's inner Kai strength, it perfectly cleanses the body. In other words, it's a fundamental technique. There's no need for him to rush. He simply needs to establish a strong foundation for the tower of his inner body strength. His fists glow with a blue color, revealing bones and veins like an X-ray. After focusing on his fists, his whole body and nervous system glow brightly blue. He tells us that he needs to ensure precise cleansing of the energy absorbed from his surroundings. It's almost like fixing small misalignments in a big fabric, strand by strand. We can see his body glowing, affecting the tree. This is called perfect cleansing of any impure energy. And if he gathers the purified energy into his danshan, also known as the elixir field or the sea of kai in the center of his body, specifically the stomach, he can complete the technique. The danshan will be the foundation that opens up a whole new world for him. He believes that a small but firm energy will grow like a snowball and eventually become an unstoppable avalanche. He stands up and wonders if he can run to Mount Hua now, but then he falls down. He forgot that he had already used all his energy learning the technique, so he needs a bit of rest. The equilibrium technique doesn't help when he needs to use his body right away. His master pops up in his imagination and remarks that he sometimes forgets to use his brain, which is true. Chun gets mad at his imagination and tells his master to go away because he's distracting him. He shouts to himself, asking how he's going to reach Mount Hua at this rate. This is the end of the first half of the second chapter. What will happen next to Chun? Will he be able to reach his destination? And what does he plan to do after reaching Mount Hua? Stay tuned for the next chapter. That is all. Thank you for joining me on this saucy manhua journey. If you enjoyed the recap don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Until next time, stay saucy.